Okay, so uh, this is on pancreatogenic uh, diabetes. And you're probably thinking, well, isn't all diabetes pancreatogenic because the islet cells that make insulin are in the pancreas? But this is uh, a specific form of diabetes. And it really is relevant. And you probably see a lot more of it than you might recognize. I've been helping take care of our homeless population during COVID. And I got asked to help with this 37 year old male who uh, I was told he had type one diabetes. But when I talked to him, he started using alcohol in his early teens. He had uh, developed chronic pancreatitis due to the alcohol. And then a few years later developed diabetes. And the, uh, he, he fits the classic description in his behavior of his diabetes for pancreatogenic diabetes. So what do you know about pancreatogenic diabetes? Now, I don't know how many of you have heard about it or think about it when you're taking care of your patients, but we're gonna talk about today when to consider pancreatogenic diabetes instead of, or I'm gonna say in addition to type one or type two diabetes, how is it unique? Uh, are patients with this form of diabetes at the same risk for the same complications that people who have type 1 or type 2 diabetes are at risk for? And then in addition to the classic micro and macro vascul vascular complications we worry about with diabetes, are there other things that you need to worry about? Um, so just to kind of review the pancreas, the endocrine parts are the islets. Uh, an islet means little island, and they're just kind of floating around between the uh, acinar cells that make the digestive juices. Uh, the acinar cells uh, are exocrine glands, and exocrine glands put their secretions into ducts, and here it's carried into the uh, intestine to uh, digest our food. And those secretions are enzymes, digestive enzymes. Whereas endocrine glands put their hormone secretions into blood vessels to be carried throughout the body. Um, the islets make up only 2% of the pancreas. The acinar tissue make up 95% or more. The islets require lots of blood flow. So that's kind of the the anatomy and some of the physiology behind the pancreas. So pancreatogenic uh, diabetes uh, in the American Diabetes Association classification is called type 3C diabetes. And it's when somebody develops endocrine pancreas dysfunction because of a disease of the exocrine pancreas. So a disease of all the digestive enzyme cells or damage to the pancreas, like being cut out, um, then, then that also uh, causes damage to the endocrine cells. And so the most common, of course, is gonna be pancreatitis of any etiology. We know that cystic fibrosis, if the people live long enough, they don't only get the exocrine pancreatic uh, dysfunction, but they develop diabetes. Uh, hemochromatosis is another one, pancreatic cancer. We'll talk a little bit more about it, it's tricky. Uh, having pancreas surgery for any reason, especially the tail. The tail of the pancreas has most of the islets with insulin secretion, the beta cells, as opposed to the head. So if somebody has the head of the pancreas removed, they're not as likely to get diabetes as if they have the tail removed, and then other rare causes. So what happens is that um, over time, and we'll, we'll talk about, this is kind of the over time, we'll talk about what happens early on, but over time, uh, the scar tissue that develops from all the inflammation or damage to those acinar exocrine cells causes the blood vessels to get damaged and then the islets don't get enough uh, blood and they become scar tissue and pretty soon they're not working either. Um, now, it's a lot more common than type one diabetes. So we think, well, the major forms of diabetes are type 1 and type 2, but type 1 diabetes is 5% or less of diabetes now, and pancreatogenic diabetes is 5 to 
uh, people in, with diabetes in Western cultures. The, the vast majority of pancreatogenic diabetes occurs because of chronic pancreatitis. And one of the main causes of chronic pancreatitis is alcohol um, over ingestion, okay? Uh, up to 90% of people who have chronic pancreatitis will develop diabetes. And so I suspect you have patients who have chronic pancreatitis, whether they've been checked for diabetes or not, uh, you need to think about. Often it's misdiagnosed, like the patient I took care of at, in the COVID hotel, um, have been misdiagnosed as type two or type one diabetes. And if they're advanced pancreatogenic diabetes, they're often diagnosed as type one, and you'll see why in a minute. Now, just recently, there's a recognition that people who've had one bout of pancreatitis and referred to as acute pancreatitis actually have a higher risk of um, diabetes uh, as well, a higher risk than they would have had if they didn't have the pancreatitis. Now, really important to understand is the uh, relationship to the incretin system. Um, the incretins like GLP-1 help keep the beta cells healthy and they help them secrete insulin. Uh, so if anything blocks those incretins, the beta cells don't function well and don't, don't do well. So what happens is we eat food, our ex Exocrine pancreas cells put the digestive juices in. They digest uh, that and hydrolyze the fat. And that digested stuff triggers the cells, the K cells and the L cells, et cetera, that release incretins. And the inc incretins, especially GLP-1, go to the beta cells and help the beta cells make insulin when they're exposed to glucose and keep those beta cells healthy. So even if you're not, if you're just getting a little bit uh, less than you need of the digestive enzymes, you might not, not hydrolyze things as well, might not digest them as well. Then the cells in the intestine don't get the right signal and you have a deficiency of the incretin hormones on the beta cells. And so then you don't make as, or the patient doesn't make as much insulin, but the beta cells haven't been destroyed yet, they're still there. So when the beta cells make less insulin, their feedback on the alpha cells is reduced and the alpha cells make more glucagon. Glucagon causes the liver to re release more sugar. So you start to get the early stages of this by this uh, incretin effect. And we'll talk more about that. And I'm sorry, this may be uh, too much information or more than people wanted to know. And there will be no quiz. I just kind of wanted you to understand that how important digestion is to uh, diabetes and how everything amazingly works together in our body. So um, as you've already surmised, the endocrinopathy of type 3C diabetes is really complex. So when you get type 1 diabetes, or if someone gets type 1 diabetes, only the beta cells are destroyed by those antibodies, attacking the beta cells, so they can no longer make insulin. But the other cells in the islets are still there, including the cells that make glucagon. However, when you have destruction of the islets by the pancreatic inflammation that goes with exocrine pancreatic disease, you lose all the islets. So you haven't just lost insulin secretion, you lose polypeptide uh, and um, glucagon uh, secretion. In addition, you have this nutrient maldigestion. So you get impairment of the incretin system. So any beta cells that are still there and able to work aren't getting the support they need to work. And then this uh, maldigestion, even if it's not frank malabsorption, which people can get, but just the mild digestion can lead to malnutrition and other health problems, especially uh, like vitamin D deficiency and osteoporosis. 
So if you give the patient uh, back enzyme and you treat their exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, you help the diabetes by improving the incretin secretion and you help the, their nutritional status. And we'll talk about this over and over today. I, I apologize for that. So early in the disease, the patient may not make enough insulin, they may be making a little bit too much glucagon, and they might hardly have any hyperglycemia at all. But then if something causes them stress, which causes more glucagon secretion, or causes them to need more insulin, like fighting an infection or taking glucocorticoids, then you might see higher blood sugars or the hyperglycemia might show up. And like all forms of diabetes, this form is progressive, and it progresses to a very brittle or labile form of diabetes, where the blood sugar extremes after meals are higher than type 1 or type 2, and then the hypoglycemia risk is more extreme. And that's because they've not only lost the beta cell secretion, but they've lost uh, the other secretions, and so they have exaggerated postprandial. They don't have the glucagon that they need to balance out when they're fasting or if they go low, and they may not be absorbing or digesting the carbohydrates and absorbing the carbohydrates. And because of the nausea um, or the pain from pancreatitis, they may not eat consistently, especially if they haven't. Um, cured their uh, alcohol abuse. Um, they don't usually go into diabetic ketoacidosis because they, they aren't quite as insulin deficient as someone with type 1, and they also don't have glucagon. And glucagon not only causes the liver to put out more glucose, it, puts out, it causes it to make more ketones. So they're less able to make ketones. Um, so they often don't have DKA, that they have just extremely labile uh, diabetes. So I'm just going to walk through this to remind you that when, when we eat, uh, our blood sugar starts to rise, that and the incretins tell our pancreas beta cells to make insulin. The insulin puts the sugar into the body cells, but also tells the liver to store glucose as glycogen. Then when we are no longer eating, the glucose will start to fall. Uh, that causes the, like we're at night when we go to bed, um, to release glucagon. And that tells the liver to release glucose. So we kind of store it when we're eating and then we release it in between meals and it's this really fine balance, um, which people with pancreatogenic diabetes have lost. So uh, the long-term risk to people with pancreatogenic diabetes include the same micro and macrovascular complications that people with type 1 or type 2 diabetes get. So they still need to be monitored for all the things we monitor our other patients, including the eye exams, foot exams, uh, cardiovascular, as uh, Grace uh, has done. Uh, but they also have a much higher risk of pancreatic cancer. Um, both diabetes and chronic pancreatitis increase the risk for getting pancreatic cancer, and it's especially high, as I'll show you from a recent study, when it's diabetes caused by uh, pancreatitis. Other things that increase the risk for pancreatic cancer include smoking cigarettes, obesity, and coexisting cirrhosis, which is not uncommon when the person got pancreatitis from alcohol use, um, or our patients with type 2 diabetes who might get pancreatitis from hypertriglyceridemia or gallbladder disease and get cirrhosis from non-alcoholic non fatty liver damage. Now, on the other hand, Diabetes can be a sign of new onset pancreatic cancer. So patients who show up with new onset diabetes, usually poorly controlled, usually associated with weight loss, that can be triggered by a subclinical pancreatic cancer. And I'm gonna tell you it is harder than heck to figure out when do I suspect this, 
how do I screen for it? We'll talk a little bit about it, but I just read a, another article in preparation for this and nobody really knows when you should screen. So, but we'll talk a little bit more about that. So the treatment is uh, lifestyle. Uh, you want to do the same things you would do to correct uh, lifestyle factors that might cause high blood sugar, like uh, diet, exercise, et cetera. And then the thing, you also want to change lifestyle that contributes to pancreatic malignancy. And fortunately, these kind of align and coincide. We, our patients who were trying to reduce their diabetes complications, we want them to not abuse alcohol and we want them to quit smoking. If they're overweight, we want them to lose weight because obesity is another risk for pancreatic cancer, but it also worsens hyperglycemia and the physical activity, the dietary modifications and for pancreatic cancer, but also for people just with diabetes, processed meats and sugar sweetened beverages are especially bad. Now, uh, just as metformin is first line therapy for type two, uh, it can be used in early uh, pancreatogenic diabetes and it's good to use it because just like metformin reduces hepatocellular carcinoma in people with cirrhosis, it reduces the risk of pancreatic cancer by as much as 70%. Uh, but people with chronic pancreatitis tend to have nausea, diarrhea, weight loss, abdominal pain, and um, they might not tolerate the metformin. But if they can, it's really beneficial in reducing that pancreatic cancer risk. Um, the incretin based therapies like the DPP-4 inhibitors and the GLP-1 receptor agonist may or may not increase the risk of pancreatitis. The latest I saw with the GLP-1 receptor analogs probably don't, and the DT DPP-4s probably do. Uh, but the better way to increase incretins in someone with pancreatogenic diabetes is to give them the uh, digestive enzyme supplements. Uh, just as in cirrhosis, you want to avoid the sulfonylureas and the glenides because of the risk of hypoglycemia. And in people with, uh, with the pancreatic insufficiency, the TZDs can increase their risk for bone fractures and fluid retention. So they're not advised in people with type 3C diabetes. So you often have to progress to insulin therapy. And here's where the brittle stuff starts to show up. You want to kind of treat them like they have type 1 as far as the insulin goes. So basal bolus type of therapy, uh, if the patient is even early in the diabetes, but they have severe malnutrition, it's recommended to use um, insulin. And uh, insulin pump therapy is often helpful. And I'm thinking that that new pump that they're trying with the dual hormones, with the insulin and the glucagon would be really good because it is a hard balance for these patients, especially if the pancreatitis is bad. Um, so it's just, uh, you know, in this patient that I was taking care of was sick with COVID and had GI symptoms from the COVID and not always eating. And then he had high blood sugar from the COVID and the severe insulin resistance. So he got lots of phone calls from me every day. Um, so it's not always easy to tell when someone has pancreatogenic diabetes. And as I said, it's often confused as either type one or type two, but then it's even more complicated because people with diabetes have a higher risk of getting pancreatitis. They, if they use alcohol, they can have the classic chronic pancreatitis from that, but they also can have hypertriglyceridemia or gallstones, or they could even get autoimmune pancreatitis uh, and then there's familial pancreatitis, and I've had a number of people in my practice with that. They often end up getting their pancreas resected, and so then they have full-blown uh, diabetes at that point. In addition, just because they have had pancreatitis doesn't mean that they might not have genetic or other reasons for developing type 1 or type 2 diabetes. So it's a really complicated picture. The literature suggests these criteria for sorting out if it's pancreatogenic or not. 
and and you know sometimes it's just hard to tell but with a history like the the man i was taking care of in in the hotel um it was pretty straightforward that at least he had a component that was pancreatogenic and the behavior of the diabetes was so brittle that that kind of uh, substantiated it. So if you have patients with chronic pancreatitis or a history of chronic pancreatitis, even if the pain part has quieted down, 90% of them are going to get diabetes. And so they should be screened at least annually with a fasting glucose and A1C. They're more likely to get the diabetes the longer they've had the chronic pancreatitis, if they've had part of their pancreas removed, or if they have calcifications within their pancreas. Now, one of the really interesting things that happens not infrequently is that nobody recognizes that they've been maldigesting or malabsorbing. And when they're not absorbing their food, they don't need much insulin. So the diabetes is there, but nobody sees it because they're not absorbing their food. So finally, somebody figures out that their diarrhea and weight loss and maybe vitamin D deficiency is due to malabsorption and starts them on pancreatic enzyme replacement. And lo and behold, all of a sudden, they go into florid hyperglycemia. So I just want to warn you to watch for that if you if you see your patients with uh, chronic pancreatitis um, and, and they haven't been optimally replaced with the enzyme therapy to watch for the flowering out of uh, diabetes. Now, interestingly, um, the primary care group I work with here had a case of someone who had one bout of pancreatitis and then she developed diabetes at a young age, meaning 30. Um, not 10, but 30. And so I started looking, well, could the one bout of pancreatitis contribute? And just in like the fall of 2019, a whole bunch of articles came out showing that one bout of pancreatitis can reduce the beta cell reserve so that if the person later develops insulin resistance, they don't have the capacity to meet the need that the insulin resistance caused, and they start to get type 2 diabetes at a younger age. But interestingly, these people also had a pretty high incidence of uh, maldigestion. And even if they had a mild case, the blue line of uh, pancreatitis versus a severe case where they were in the ICU, they had a significant risk of having the exocrine insufficiency where they're kind of subtly developing uh, malnutrition. So uh, I had never heard of this. The, the doctors I work with here had never heard of it. And we were very interested in, and reviewed this article that I uh, share with you here. So uh, some of the clinical pearls is that type 3C diabetes um, 80% of it's due to chronic pancreatitis. And when it's due to chronic pancreatitis, it's considered a pre-malignant disease. A recent article showed that the highest risk for pancreatic cancer in this setting is when you develop, when the patient develops diabetes from the pancreatitis. So just having type 2 diabetes increases the risk for pancreatic cancer. Just having pancreatitis increases the risk more than just having diabetes. Having a combination of diabetes and pancreatitis increases the risk more than having either by itself, but having diabetes caused by pancreatitis is the highest risk, and it's something like a 13 times increased risk for, pancre for pancreatic cancer. But just having one bout of acute pancreatitis increases the risk two times. And that's something I don't think that we ever thought about. Um, if somebody has pancreatitis due to alcohol, um, they're more likely to progress to diabetes, uh, even if, that, if the one, one bout of pancreatitis from alcohol, let alone the chronic. And then if the patient has both cirrhosis and pancreatitis, uh, that is not an uncommon um, combination. 
And so you need to kind of think about that in patients like uh, Grace uh, was describing. And it, you probably would know if he had chronic pancreatitis, but with his weight loss, it's just something else to think about. So when to consider pancreatogenic diabetes instead of or in addition to type 1 or type 2 diabetes, if there's a history of any type of exocrine pancreatic disease, especially chronic pancreatitis. Um, and think about pancreatic cancer in someone with new onset diabetes with marked weight loss. Um, so how is pancreatogenic diabetes unique? Well, it damages all the beta cells and the diabetes is more brittle. They have a higher risk of hypo and a higher, lower risk of DKA. And that they also have an impaired incretin system due to the maldigestion and the maldigestion needs to be treated. Are patients with pancreatogenic diabetes at risk for the same complications? Yes, but they're also at risk for that maldigestion, malabsorption, malnutrition. That needs to be treated for its own sake, plus to help the diabetes, then the higher risk of low blood sugar and of pancreatic cancer. So I have a couple extra slides that I added. One, it just talks about um, the, that they don't always have steatorrhea, but you need to think about the maldigestion. How do you diagnose pancreatic uh, exocrine insufficiency? There's all these tests that are very complicated, but there's a new test where it's a stool sample for fecal elastase one, and at normal level is over 200. Severe would be under 100, and then there's the, the mild 100 to 200. In this range, it often misses people, uh, and you may need to work with a gastroenterologist to do some of these other tests that I don't have a clue how to do, but I wanted to make you aware of that almost as a screening test. And then uh, interestingly, we've been talking about damage to the, or a disease of the exocrine pan pancreas causing diabetes, which is a disease of the endocrine pancreas. And this paper just came out showing that when people get diabetes, it can cause exocrine pancreas dysfunction. And the people, uh, Desmond Schatz is a famous researcher on type one diabetes out of Florida. And his group just showed that a fair number of people with type one diabetes have evidence of pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. Um, when you do that fecal elastase test, you need to be sure, like they come in with diarrhea and blood sugars all over the place. Uh, if they haven't, if they have celiac and it hasn't been treated, then they're going to have a false positive fecal elastase. And so you want to treat that first and, and check for that first. And then lastly, if you do want to screen for pancreatic cancer, the best test is an endoscopic ultrasound, especially good at finding solid lesions and sort of complementary to that is an MRI, especially for cystic lesions, but of not very much use and giving a lot of radiation is a CAT scan. And I didn't give you a lot of time or questions. I apologize, but I was excited to share this info with you because you may be seeing more of this than you've recognized seeing. And we can always talk about more in the future, but any questions or comments on that or on, on Grace's patient?